Welcome to the Rural Report, a program that enlists experts to provide Kansas farmers and ranchers with the latest information about how COVID-19 is affecting agriculture. Rural Report is a special production of Kansas Farm Bureau in partnership with KFRM's Dwayne Taves and WIBW's Greg Coggy. Today we have the opportunity to catch up with Kansas Department of Agriculture Secretary Mike Beam and Kansas Department of Health and Environment Secretary Dr. Lee Norman. Gentlemen, uh, great to have you on the program with us uh, as we continue through this pandemic. Uh, we'll jump right off into the uh, the questions. Uh, Secretary Beam, uh, last week there were some media reports about the prepping of potential disposal sites in the event uh, of a hog depopulation becoming necessary. Uh, can you talk a little about uh, what that process would entail and, and how likely that we think that sites like that might be necessary? Sure. And first I would say that uh, compared to three to four weeks ago, uh, it's looking more favorably uh, that our Kansas market pigs uh, will be able to find a home uh, and, and go through the, the normal processing marketing and processing channels. But uh, we have been planning uh, for quite some time with uh, uh, the Division of Bur Emergency Management uh, and KDHE as well about what we may need to do uh, as we look at what other states are doing. And, and as we speak, uh, depopulation and disposal is, is occurring uh, in some of the larger hog-producing states uh, because their their plants, a lot of those plants were completely shut down for a couple of weeks uh, back in, in late April and May. So we've uh, we've got one site uh, that's uh, permitted and uh, contracts you know agreed to, and are now kind of finalizing the the plans for you know an approved euthanasia and disposal, which would be through composting. So that, that's being set up, and we're ho hoping we don't need this, but uh, we want to be prepared if, if that happens. And we were looking at a site in southwest Kansas uh, and running into some difficulties finding one, and at about that time, uh, the processing plant in Oklahoma uh, and, and those pigs in southwest Kansas that, that go to that plant, uh, they, they've Put together some alternatives in case it's necessary. So, yes, we are preparing uh, for at least one, possibly two sites, uh, if they're necessary in, in Kansas. Secretary Norman, uh, from KDHE's perspective, uh, things that you would add to that and how we've come to this point? Yeah, that's uh, happy to be here and answer your questions. The uh, First off, Secretary Beam and Agriculture and KDHE have worked side by side through this, I think, along with the companies in a very amiable matter, manner, because we knew from the start that uh, there was possibilities of coming across purposes. And and I will say that the companies have stepped up and because um, I wear in my agency two hats. One is I have the environment. So as to Secretary Bean's point, um, we have to make sure that what we do is in keeping with um, you know, EPA standards and relevant laws. We work with county commissioners so that um, uh, they are in agreement with what we're asking in their county. The other side of the other hat that I wear, of course, is human health as uh, Secretary of Health. Um, and, you know, I, it, it's hard a little bit to forecast for the future, but a, a lot of what's going to go on in ag as it relates to this matter uh, relates to how much human disease there is. Right now, we've had a, a terrific number of cases in the four most hard-hit counties. Uh, production is going on, and to Secretary Beam's point, uh, it's been great that we've stayed ahead of it and haven't had to euthanize animals at this point. Uh, what I think with our increased amount of testing, very strong responses by local health departments, uh, I'm hoping that even if we get a second or third wave uh, of the COVID-19, that we have gotten on top of it with the engineering controls and the OSHA-like things that go on in the plants. We have to remember, of course, the workers live in communities and they live in families, and they've done strong work uh, with the health departments in the communities. And with between that and much wider available testing, um, even in the absence of a vaccine or antiviral medicines for the humans, 
um, I think that we're going to be on top of it as it relates to doing everything we can do to prevent the disease. Because the way to prevent this euthanizing um, food animal uh, problem is to prevent humans from getting sick. And that is also uh, the other side of that. So, yes, doing the right things for the environment in terms of disposing of animals if that's necessary. But, yes, pushing down volumes of cases so that we can keep um, the trains running. I want to follow up with uh, Secretary Beam. Obviously, Department of Ag has been involved in a number of exercises for a foreign animal disease. Uh, this obviously unlike that scenario because it uh, is affecting the human population, but was that helpful in, in trying to work our way through some of the issues that potentially could come up? It, it was helpful um, because the, the whole concept of how to euthanize and properly dispose of animals in a foreign animal disease uh, situation uh, has been uh, multi-agency planning for years. Uh, But I think we have found that maybe we weren't as prepared uh, for an emergency as as we thought we were when when it looks like you've got to put it on the ground. So but, you know, most of these, a lot of these facilities, uh, particularly, you know, the, on, on the swine side, you know, have a permit, permitted place for, for deep burial. Uh, but, you know, there's problems with that. And, and, and uh, the, the, the composting disposal manner in which uh, we've talked about in, in exercising for foreign animal disease uh, and through this process, if necessary, seems to be, you know, the most environmental friendly uh, manner to which which to handle it. So uh, we've, we're learning, uh, and that has helped, but we have found that we've got a lot, once we can catch our breath on on this situation, we need to, to really focus again on uh, how best to handle a foreign animal disease. And for, hopefully in a foreign, an, foreign animal disease, it's a few isolated areas and not know, a large population uh, across the state or in multi-states. Dr. Norman, you kind of alluded to the the answer that I think that you're probably going to give to the next question, but really the entire food supply chain was deemed essential and remained open through COVID. Uh, Walk us through the process to get to that point and what measures and conversations were taking place during those peak uh, eruptions, if you will, particularly in western Kansas, regarding keeping those food processing plants open, even if at a reduced rate of slaughter? Yes, uh, good question. The, um, you know, the, the, the CDC recommendations for the managing of, uh, of infected or exposed persons would have shut, if we would have implemented those things, uh, lock, stock, and barrel, it would have shut down the plants because there was such widespread disease, and with more testing, there was more widespread disease, and uh, it would have uh, really, I'm sure, shut shut down. But a whole bunch of things converged at the same time. Um, One was, again, the plants stepping up, the companies, uh, Ag and KDHE, saying what can we, and I hate to use the word get by with, but what is it that's a safe alternative to 14 14 days of quarantine uh, of everybody that was uh, exposed to a person under investigation. Because face it, with the number of positive cases that were emanating out of those four counties that we're talking about, everybody would have been uh, exposed to a person under investigation and under a 14-day quarantine. So we said, what is it that's safe? And again, a, a lot of it's a younger population. We're not talking about a nursing home population. And we said what we can do is make the modifications in the isolation and quarantine as long as those engineering and scheduling uh, uh, of um, the workers, as long as the um, cafeterias have enough elbow room and whatnot, if we pull this off right, we can get by with a safe environment that is less than the full 14-day quarantine. And it worked. Uh, We had great cooperation from NIOSH. Uh, the OSHA-like uh, equivalent within the CDC, they were on site and walked the floors and everything with the, with the companies. We had CDC uh, disease containment experts that came and helped us, and then a very aggressive testing, even, uh, testing strategy, even in the, at a time when we were having a hard time getting enough test materials to work with. So I, I really, in 
looking back at it, and particularly from my home state of Iowa and South Dakota and other places that I know very well, I think we almost couldn't have done it better given the hand of cards we were dealt. Well, obviously, COVID disrupted a lot of key links in the food supply chain, uh, but some quick action on the regulatory front helped avoid it of breaking those links, maybe just stretched them a bit. Uh, what do you see coming down the road, and are there ideas to streamline regulation or create regional options for consumers and uh, per, uh, persevere in, in the goal of food safety? Uh, Secretary Beam, if you'd like to lead off this segment. Well, I think the, the first thing is to to take the lessons learned uh, and be prepared. Uh, and I would say... Uh, I don't think we'll we'll see these uh, meat pro- the larger meat processing plants make any changes in, in their procedures and, and their in, in the line speed and all that. So number one, I think we have to realize that we may never see quote 100 uh, percent again. Uh, now there may be you know some ways to, to, to change it, but uh, and I think we'll see a considerable investment in our processing sector as is there a way to do this with you know less uh, risk to, uh, to humans uh, so that's going to be in play and as you might suspect uh, this has created a lot of discussion about how to buy directly uh, from farmers or buy locally uh, and, and so I don't necessarily think we'll see streamlined regulations I think uh, we'll see more awareness and understanding of, you know, at the local level, how, uh, you know, food could be marketed, processed and marketed. Um, but the, the interesting thing through all of this is, you know, we have over almost 90 what I call smaller state-inspected meat plants in the state. And last I checked, not one owner employee uh, had been tested positive. And our inspectors that inspect these smaller plants, not one of them uh, have had a, a positive case to date. So, but the, these small plants have been really taxed in, in that capacity and, and doing all that they can uh, to try to absorb some of that uh, that supply that, that did not make it through the, the normal channel. So I think we're going to see a lot of dialogue about uh, you know, is there things that these smaller plants can do? Uh, is there room for more plants? And quite frankly, I think uh, particularly uh, in the pork and beef sector, you're going to hear some discussion about that. And if so, will they be? Will they look the same as, as the plants that we have in operation today? Dr. Norman, anything you'd like to add from KDHE's perspective? Well, um, just a couple thoughts. Uh, I th- when I stand back at this, I look at it and say, what can we do? And I think Secretary Bean hit on this, essentially to building resilience up and down that chain, everything from, you know, uh, when, you know, calving operations all the way up through processing and slaughter and, and shipping. And because when we're working at full capacity, we don't have resilience in the system. And I know that it makes at a more profitable operation, I'm sure, to have it running at full capacity. Um, and yet um, it's at moments like this where that full capacity approach makes is the antithesis, I think, of resilience. Unless there can be other pop-off valves that allow for resilience, um, as, as Secretary Bean points out, to kind of plan B and plan C. In other words, a just-in-case strategy. I will say, though, um, the things we've learned in those in southwest Kansas, and I won't go into the specifics and with the organizations by name, but it's been applied in other counties and even other food industries that, granted, the stakes weren't as high as having live animals that need to be that we had to consider for depopulation. But uh, but still, uh, what is it that we did from an engineering, from a human factors management, from infection control practices? What are the things we did to build in resilience uh, so that that the that the, the assembly line, if you will, or um, didn't get stopped? So I think a key word we're kind of taking a little bit of a breather now, uh, and I think a key word will be resilience, resiliency within the the food supply chain. And I think that's something that we need to tease out 
for plan B and C. And because uh, we certainly had to invent it on the fly this time and it went well. I'd like to point out uh, those companies uh, have invested millions of dollars putting some new uh, uh, plexiglass, uh, new safeguards, different things that they've done to these plants to retrofit, so to speak. I suspect with that investment, they're not going to pull that out as soon as this is technically over. Oh, I don't think so. I think that's exactly uh, going to be the, the norm uh, and maybe even enhanced uh, as they learn more. I would like to add one thing into what you just said, which is uh, is, uh, is a chilling thought, actually. Uh, when I was stationed in the Middle East in 2017 and 2018, there's a Middle East respiratory syndrome that's throughout the Arabian Peninsula. It's also a coronavirus with very high fatality rates. Uh, it didn't peak out till the fourth year. And when I was there seven years into it, it was still grinding along. So I don't know where this virus is going to wind up. I don't know where exactly the vaccine will go. But just to the, this point of what will remain on those engineering controls, I think we have to play the long game and consider the fact that this could be with us for years. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll be beaten into submission with a vaccine. But short of that, um, I think it, it's not going to be a flash in the pan like SARS was in 2003 and 2004. Dr. Norman, that leads directly to the next question, then. The state and the country as well uh, are all opening up again to, to some degree. Uh, it's kind of a, on a case-by-case or state-by-state or even county-by-county county basis. But you referenced the virus certainly still is out there. Uh, things that you think the ag community and, and people in general uh, should uh, be considering for the possibility of a, a flare-up this fall or winter. Yeah, I think of a number of things. I think there's things we – I don't know the animal health side as well, obviously. I've spent 42 years taking care of humans, um, so I know that side better, human medicine. But I think a few things. One is that we have more uh, serology testing capabilities. We're just getting online with COVID-19-specific human serology testing so that we can do prevalence studies uh, and find out where the hotbeds of disease are, are they – and where the to hotspot to go in with what I would call early strike teams. Strike team is a uh, concept of uh, when, whether it's a nursing home or a packing plant, um, when something bumps up, what is it we can do? And uh, I think that as we have more protective equipment inventory, more testing capability and inventory, I think we can respond with what I really want to do with humans anyway is to push down the incidence of disease. So I think we can help out the ag sector terrifically by helping out the human sector by doing the right thing. Um, curiously, uh, there's also one, and we're experimenting with it now, along with K KU Engineering, is looking at wastewater to figure out, uh, because we can measure viral, the COVID-19 viral particles that pass through the human system and into the wastewater system, that are an early indicator of when there's a problem. I can think of it as an early warning system. Uh, we've even tested uh, some communities that haven't had any COVID-19 identified that we've identified in their wastewater stream, uh, not necessarily high levels. But those are the kinds of innovative thinking that I think will really help to trigger early responses and keeping people healthy, identifying a strike team response and uh, keeping people healthy, which should help the ag sector terrifically. Secretary Beam, any other final thoughts? Yeah, I, the only thing I would say is we're not, uh, Secretary Norman said this, we're not out of the woods completely. And, and, I, and I hope that our farms and ranches and, and agribusinesses uh, have maybe brushed up and put together, at least in their mind, a, uh, a continuity of operations plan. Because, you know, we could get into, uh, you know, fall harvest, uh, busy time of year, and, you know, it's a family and maybe one or two employees. And if you have, you know, one or two people become ill, uh, you know, that could be a problem at a you know, micro level, but very much a, a huge challenge uh, to those family operations. So I think, you know, we need to be aware of that and continue to, to practice uh, some of the guidelines uh, as we get into throughout the year and, and beyond if, if necessary. Well, our thanks to Kansas Department of Ag Secretary Mike Beam, Kansas Department of Health and Environment Secretary Dr. Lee Norman, 
Joining us on the Rural Report, brought to you as a production of Kansas Farm Bureau, KFRM, and WIBW. Have a great day.